But we've talked about how the Lord's Prayer is really the heartbeat of a citizen of the kingdom of God. So for those who are followers of Jesus, Jesus, in that great Sermon on the Mount, lays forth for them something entirely different than what they might expect, something radical, something amazing of what it is to be a follower of Him, what it is to live for His kingdom, and what His kingdom people pray like. We've seen so far that His kingdom people pray for the name of God to be hallowed, to be made holy both now and forevermore, for the kingdom of God to be progressing and God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. They pray for the physical and spiritual provisions that we need to get through each day. They pray the truth of the gospel, that they are a sinner in desperate need of the forgiveness of God Almighty. And so with the fullness of all of that, we turn to the final of Jesus' petitions. And in this petition, Jesus speaks directly to the battle that his followers, his kingdom citizens, will face daily until Christ returns or calls them home. He speaks to the victory that's needed if there is to be revolution. We've uh, subtitled this sermon series, A Manifesto for Revolution, and if there to be revolution in our personal lives, in our local churches, and out in the world to which the disciples are going to take the gospel, they're going to need this last petition. Imagine the emboldening speech of a leader for his troops before they go out to face their enemy, or the coach as they're so you get the team surrounded there. They're, they're about to go out and face the opponent on the sport field there. That type of uh, motivation and encouragement and reminding them of the opponent that they're going to face, the enemy that is around them, and to encourage them to victory. I think all this in a bit is, is what we see in this final petition as Jesus turns their attention to the battle that must be won. Let's read his final petition here in Matthew 6. We'll actually take the whole of the Lord's example prayer, starting in verse number 9. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Will you join me in prayer? God, we thank you for this time. I pray that you would guide our study, that we would apply this text as we should understand it, as we should, and that we would pray in this way, this example that you've set for us, but also that it would be a prayer from our heart, that our hearts would embrace your will and your kingdom and your kingdom way, Lord, and that our lives would exemplify this prayer as well. We ask this through Jesus Christ. Amen. So this final petition speaks to the reality of the war that's going on. It's a prayer for the spiritual battle, the spiritual warfare that citizens of the king live in. It's a final piece to this example prayer that defines the enemy of the kingdom and that contextualizes the Lord's prayer in the battlefield. Why are we in a battle? Why is there a battle raging on, spiritual warfare. Well, 1 John 5, 19 tells us, it says there, we know that we are from God and the world and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. We're from God and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. You see, the scriptures talk about how well, we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Well, we were enemies of God. See, we went in that moment of salvation from being an enemy of God 
to an adopted son or daughter, and we talked about that and how amazing that is. But we also not only now are an adopted son and daughter of God Almighty and for his kingdom, but we also now have a new enemy, the evil one, Satan, the devil. There's now a battle that we are in. This spiritual warfare comes with a few dangers. And in part, there's dangers in the extremes. Whenever we speak to spiritual warfare, we can fall into two dangers on either extreme in thinking in regards to these things. C.S. Lewis, in his book, The Screwtape Letters, spoke to this when he says, there are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. They themselves are equally pleased by both errors and hail a materialistic and a magician with the same delight. What he speaks to there is the idea that there are two dangers. One is ignoring the battle to where we're living blissfully ignorant of the spiritual warfare that's going on. And secondly, would be a danger in obsessing over the battle in spiritual warfare. Jesus' prayer here hopefully leads us to a balanced approach to spiritual warfare and thinking on these things. And that's hopefully uh, where we'll be guided today. So in regards to these two dangers, the first being to ignore the battle. Uh, about a week ago, actually one week ago today, it was Sunday evening, and we had gotten home from our Kingdom Kids uh, ministry, and we were making some dinner, and my daughter loves pasta. So she had some pasta on the stove, or we had put some pasta on the stove for her. We have a gas stove. And as I was standing there in the kitchen, I looked over, and when I looked over to the stove, I see not only the flame that's heating the pot, but I see my daughter, six, on a little stool with her uh, utensil there, about to grab some pasta out of the dish on the stove. In addition to that, she happened to be wearing what she got in Kingdom Kids through a great little illustration Miss Mary did, these big cloth butterfly wings that she's wearing, and they're flapping, you know, in the wind. So I look over, and visions of a flaming butterfly in my house are going through my head, and I just, stop! Don't do that! Well, her response was confusion. She makes pasta. What's the problem? I'm just, I've seen you guys do this all the time. And it was kind of offensive or, 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 or troubling that I would see such a danger in this situation. And, and she did the right thing, and we um, let the pasta finish cooking, and, and she was safe. But in a way, there's a lot of Christians who are operating and functioning in their life in the midst of this battle and warfare that's going on spiritually, and they're just blissfully ignorant. And they're constantly near danger, but yet not aware of this. And it is a recipe for ending up a flaming butterfly, okay? It could be very destructive to your life. So we don't want to be that. What does it look like? What does it look like when we are not giving enough attention to the warfare going on? Well, it looks like people who think they can play with sin and temptation. We see, our prayer must match our actions. That seems very simple, but consider it here. If I'm going to pray, Lord, lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from the evil one, and then I turn around and place myself into temptation, it's insincere. That doesn't make any sense. And the Lord, no doubt, sees our insincerity. We can't play with temptation and sin. Let me put it this way. Some of you are treating sin like I treat Penn Station's chocolate chip cookies. Have you ever had one of those cookies? They're about this big, maybe, maybe more like this big. And they, they, they have a crunch, a little crunch to them if they do them right, and they have a saltiness to it, but then it gives way to the buttery, gooey inside. And then there's, the, we'll call them, milk chocolate bricks on the inside. That when you bite into one, it just takes over the flavor profile, but then it, it, it subsides back into that classic cookie flavor with the buttery 
salty goodness. I like them. So how do I treat them? Well, it might be Sunday afternoon. We've had lunch out and enjoyed that. And I bring up the fact that, you know, we didn't have any dessert today. Here we are on East Washington Street again, and well, there's a Penn Station. It, it might be like, oh, the kids need a haircut. I'll take them. Thanks, honey. That's so kind of you. I take the kids to the Great Clips. You know, I don't think we hardly ever do anything for these children. I think, I think they could use a little treat, a snack. What stores are... Hey, look, there's a Penn Station right there. Wait, is it Tuesday? Did I forget to pack my lunch again? I should certainly... It, wait, is Tuesday the day that they give out the free cookies at Penn Station? Is there one right there? I know exactly what I'm doing. I'm placing myself constantly within the realm of temptation of the Penn Station chocolate chip cookies. And that's if I were to determine that Penn Station cookies were sinful, which I haven't. They are actually very helpful for my spiritual condition. <laughs> but if I did, you would say, I'm acting like an idiot. That's so dumb. What are you doing? You're placing yourself constantly in the realm of temptation. And I give us a silly illustration like that because if we thought deeply and opened our hearts up to one another, we might realize there's some more unsavory temptations and lifestyles, choices, and things that we do, that we place ourselves in such a temptation. You see it, the results of it, all over our, our world as we look and we see Christian upon Christian upon Christian failing, falling. We say, oh, that's just terrible. And it is. For the honor and sake of the name of God, whose name we want to be hallowed and made holy. So if we were to embrace the heart of this prayer, we can't treat sin and temptation that way. We have other better examples from Joseph running away and dropping the coat to other passages, speaking of resisting the devil and he will flee from you. Now, we have to take it seriously in the spiritual warfare that's going around. If we really understand and truly get the battle that's happening, we'll treat sin and temptation with the respect it deserves. It also looks like not spending time in prayer. My kids are very dependent upon me at this age, and if I went through a whole day, my wife went through a whole day, and they didn't ask us anything, we would be curious as to what's going on. And when we are our Heavenly Father doesn't hear from us, we must think, well, they must think they have this. That's a scary place to be in. Not spending time in the world, in the Word, excuse me, not spending time in the Word. It's like an a, a a, a explorer without his map or his compass. Are you without your GPS? How are you going to get where you're trying to go? It looks like not spending time in fellowship in the local church. I can say this here without convicting any of you too bad because, well, you're here. But to not spend time in the local fellowship with brothers and sisters in Christ is to not really understand the battle that's going on. Our weekly gathering is many things, but it is a place where we learn who needs prayer, who needs love. How can I help my brothers and sisters in the battle if I'm not here? It's how I, I come and be re-encouraged and renewed in my heart to go out and face those temptations and those battles that I'm going to fight that week by renewing what I believe through song, by hearing what I believe proclaimed in the Word. It's a place where we gather and we decide we're going to teach our children about the Lord and the goodness of God and His Word so that when they grow up, they'll be able to navigate life in the battle that's going on. I mean, it, it may look like lollipops and, 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 and streamers in the back, you know, but there is real work being done, and it is important to the battle. And if you think about the world to which the little kids back here are going to be living in, they desperately need it. So our Sunday school teachers, our Sunday school helpers, they are an important part of this spiritual warfare and battle we have going on, and that's what we come here for. I'm excited that my kids get to, to learn and grow because they, they're going to need it. It's a place where those injured in the battle throughout the week can come and, 
be healed and encouraged. They're those who need respite from the difficult times can come and we can renew our resolve and feed ourselves the good food of God's word. We're in a battle, and if we recognize that, we're going to need this place. More, I should say, this people. The church is the people. So there is a danger there in not taking seriously the battle, but there's also a danger on the flip side, and that's to become obsessed with spiritual warfare. The devil and demons are not responsible for every negative thing that happens to us and those around us. And when we obsess over this, we can end up finding the devil in everything, and it can lead to a wrong perspective. What does it look like? Well, it could look like lacking peace. We have many verses in scriptures, including 1 John 4, 4, little children, you are from God and have overcome them, for he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. We are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. He who began a good work is going to complete it in you. Where, O death, is your sting? We have so many verses that speak to the victory of God through Christ in us, and we ought to be confident. We ought to have peace, and we can have peace if we get too caught up and obsessive over the spiritual warfare. We can begin to erode peace in our life if we're not turning these things over to God and relying on Him and His power. And that's the second way it could look. It could look like we think It's all about us, that we have to go around and and, and put out these fires and deal with all this spiritual warfare going on as if it's not God's work. Hear the heart of this prayer. It's, It's about God. You deliver us from evil. Finally, it can look like a disregard for sound doctrine. Sometimes a believer delving into obsessing over things of spiritual warfare, can begin to do and believe something based entirely on experience or feeling that's not actually consistent with the truth of God's Word, the Bible's teaching. We could try to provide some examples and things that might come to mind that could be a result of such a thing would be things like indulgences where, or, or purchasing a special prayer rug I remember getting one in the mail one time. It was like one of these things where they mail you something and they like give you a, a nickel and they're like, hey, he's please send back $100. And then you're like, wait, what do I do with this nickel? I see what you're doing here. But this was the, kind of the spiritualized version of that. It was like, here's this prayer rug and it had, you know, this very Caucasian European Jesus photo on it, right? And it's like, this has been prayer, prayed over by these special people, and so use this. Oh, and we need your money, too. And then it's like, well, I'm not, but then I'm like, wait, you know, you start to go throw away the, what is this picture? I can't, it's a pit. what do I do with this picture of Jesus? Like, and, uh, and, and, and there's these oddities and, and, and sort of superstitious things that people get led into, that disregard sound truth and doctrine. And we can end up in such a place if we become obsessed over spiritual warfare. And again, maybe at the heart of it is a lack of turning these things over to God and trusting Him, feeling like we have to control all that's going on in the spiritual world. Let's take rest in leaving that to the Lord. So there are dangers and extremes. I also want to talk about the necessity of this part of the prayer. So Jesus does a succinct prayer, right? Remember in verse 7, he contrasts his prayer with heaping upon empty phrases. And so he provides us this prayer that's uh, very succinct in, in its time, but here he does include this petition, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. That should speak to us, reminding us of the importance of this prayer. And when I say prayer, I mean this petition, this prayer for uh, protection, for deliverance from evil. We need it. It can be a daily threat. We talked about in the first of our series on the Lord's Prayer how prayer at its core is communion with God, is talking with God, is spending time with God. And temptation and sin in particular, that is a threat to our communion with God. 
So in praying for protection from this, we are praying for protection of our communion with God, which we so desperately want to maintain. We need it because it never leaves us. We're not able to become immune to temptation through growing so mature in Christ. Ultimately, yes, in glorification, but not in this time, in this life. We don't grow too old for temptation. We find ourselves daily in need of this prayer. If we think ourselves freed from the need of such a prayer, of God's help in overcoming temptation and staying free from sin, then we have overestimated our own spiritual state and we have grossly underestimated our need for God's grace. And this brings us back to that gospel truth tied into our petition in verse 12, forgiving us our debts. It's ties to the truth that we are those who are depraved and need salvation, need forgiveness. And in this prayer, it's showing that not only do we need it in our salvation, but we need it daily in our attempt to have sanctification or to walk according to what the Lord would have us do. We need God's grace in both and desperately. for We know ourselves, and that's why we need to pray this prayer. We can also see from this petition that it's God's work, that we are not able in our own accord, in our own goodness, to have the power over sin. This leads us to be reminded that we can't keep a nice control over our sin, and it can come back to bite us if we fail to recognize that. I saw a YouTube video this week of a lady who was in a photo shoot with a lion at the zoo. That's what it was. She was having a photo shoot, and there's a lion there. And I had heard this illustration, and so I, I wanted to see if this was true, and it is. <laughs> and it was a controlled environment. So they had the lion. It was a younger lion, and it had a, a chain around it, and there was a guy who was holding back the chain, holding the line back with the chain. And then there was another guy there, and he was going to keep the, the, the lady from being injured during the, the photo shoot. And there was, I'm sure, other people and crew there. So it was supposedly a, 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 tr a controlled environment. Well, as you can assume, since it's on YouTube, uh, it didn't work out that way. And in a moment, as the lady described, she didn't see or hear because she took her eyes off of that lion for a moment and then the man who had the chain around the lion didn't have enough leverage, and the other guy wasn't in position, and the lion pounced on her, tackled her, and injured her. And she survived. But as you see that, there's an illustration of how sometimes we're tempted as Christians to think we have control over our sin. We think we have an uncontrolled environment. Well, it hasn't really hurt anybody yet, and, and yeah, I, I, I do lose my temper a lot, or I do fall into that sin a lot, or yeah, I, I tend to be that way, but, you know. And maybe we've had that sin for a long time, and we've hung on to that, but don't be mistaken. It's a lion, and it can hurt you. We see that we need the Lord. Deliver us from evil. That's the heart here. Remember, it is not a heart of dependence or a heart of self-sufficiency, but instead a heart of dependency we see here. We see that the prayer comes from one who's dependent upon God Almighty. Hearing the heart of a prayer is so important because for, for many, we get really good at saying a prayer, but less become experts at the heart of the prayer. And the Lord's Prayer is one we want to engage in the heart of the prayer and allow it to transform our, our lives. Uh, notice how different the solution for temptation and, and, and evil God's is than the world's. 
So we're talking about evil here. We're talking about spiritual warfare. And the world still does, I would say for the most part, recognize the presence of some evil. But what's the solution for that some evil out there that they recognize? Well, they throw different things at it. One would be education. Well, if we get enough good education and we can just educate everybody, then, then these evils we can deal with. I'm all for education, and we're all for education, but there's no amount of education that will remove the evils of this world. You can't educate out sexual immorality. You can't educate out murders. You say, well, not education. Well, then we can throw money at it. And it's not to say that poverty and lacking can lead down a road of temptation and ultimately sin, but no amount of money is going to stop the evil of this world. No amount of money will solve the problem. Well, if our, our education and our money can't solve this problem of evil, what do we do? Well, we can move the goalpost. So maybe those things aren't evil anymore, and we call what's evil good, and what's good evil. The solution of God's different, and it's that we need the Lord. We need His deliverance. We are incapable of our own. We know where the problem of evil comes from. We can go all the way back to the fall and see where this line of sin has come. And we know that there is an enemy, the evil one, Satan and his demons and those in this spiritual warfare that would love nothing more to continue this evil in our world. And as bad as those things are, we also know the solution in Christ Jesus, his forgiveness, and ultimately the power of God over Satan and all his demonic forces. And so in knowing those things, we, unlike the world, can place our hopes and our actions and our resources in the right places. And one of those places is in prayer to God for his help. Prayer to God and his help for our lives individually, but also for our church family. Notice, remind, or let's be reminded of the context of this prayer. It is all our Father, our daily bread, our debts, and it is lead us. So we're praying for one another here. We're praying for each other. Now, a question that comes to mind when you read this passage, maybe some of you already had it. If you hadn't, then apologize for putting it in your head. But the question is, does God lead us into temptation? If we're praying that He doesn't, it kind of feels like there's an option that He might. Well, we want to allow Scripture to interpret Scripture. So we do so, we find passages like James chapter 1, verse 13, where it says there, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. Now, that's a pretty decisive statement. So we know God does not tempt. So what's happening here? Well, I mean, James makes it clear there in that passage that no evil exists in God. He's not demanding our holiness while also attempting us to fail. He's not taking a delight in sin. This isn't a cruel game that God is playing with us. It's not as if God brings us to the brink, to the edge of, of sin and sees what we're going to do in some odd game. This is not the character and nature of our God. So what's happening here in this prayer? Why are you teaching us to pray this way, God? Well, I read quite a bit on this, and we could spend a whole sermon series, and a lot of people get really, you know, looking at the term and what it means, lots of things, okay? And, and feel free in your own, own time to do that, but my conclusion on it is that this is one of those cases where we can sometimes get ourselves in a bind by trying to do too many theological doctrinal interpretation gymnastics, if you will. Because I think if we look at the entirety of each of these petitions, what are these petitions all saying? And I think what we're going to see is they're all saying God, things that God is according to the will of God, things that we know He will do or has promised to do. So, hallowed be your name. Does God hallow His name? Is He going to make His name holy? Does He want His name to be made holy? Yes, it's not as if He doesn't. 
Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is God's will. He's going to do this ultimately someday. He, he desires us. He wants to do this. Give us our daily bread. Is God going to provide for us? He's promised to provide for us. He's going to give us all we need spiritually. Yes, he's going to do that. He's doing that. Will he forgive our debts? He's promised so. This is our hope and our salvation. Yes, these are all things that he does and is doing. So when we say, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, just like all the rest, we're praying putting our will in a line with the will of God and the will of his kingdom. It's as if we're all dumping what we have in mind and we want what God has in mind. So we're affirming something that is in the character and nature of God. So when we pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, we're not asking God to do something that is in disagreement with his normal good nature, but we're actually asking him to do something that is in accord with his regular, good, normal nature. Think of the heart of this prayer. It's the person who recognizes their ultimate dependence upon God and says, Lord, I don't want to be where I'm going to go and fail in temptation Lord, you help me. I need you. Deliver me from evil. You are a God of refuge. It's along the lines of the Psalms that, that David would pray. Uh, we, we had the song we sang right before I came to preach, which was, hold me fast. There's kind of a sense of that in this prayer, that God, I need you. I need your shelter. I need your protection. I know there is a battle waging on, and it's with the evil one, and he is powerful, but you are more so, Lord, Keep me from temptation. Deliver me from evil. And that, I think, is plain for us all to understand and see. We've been there. We've felt that, Lord willing, and we can pray that way. Thinking of the end of this petition, our translation in the ESV, English Standard Version, says, but deliver us from evil. You may have a little note there, and and you may have a slightly different translation, but uh, the translation that oftentimes you see now is the evil one. Now, it's, you know, not entirely consequential, but in so much as this, that it, it seems that it's likely that it should be translated the evil one, and what that does maybe is keep us from going down a path where we think that uh, evil or temptation and, and sins coming from this sort of inanimate, you know, Star Wars kind of world. No, it's in place of, it's coming from a particular person, the evil one, Satan, and his forces. And so we are petitioning God to keep us and protect us from the evil one and all his forces. And we have every reason to believe God will do just that. And that's the hope. First Peter noted in chapter 5, verse 8, Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone devour, to devour. We are aware of the fact that there are temptation and sin in this world, but we also know, James 4, 7, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And that's seen in this little two-line petition. Resist the devil, recognizing I don't want to be led down a path where I'm tempted to sin against God, but I want deliverance. We're relying on God, submitting ourselves to him, and he will flee from us. Again, ultimately, the battle is won on the cross, and it can be won daily in our life through the work of the Holy Spirit. If you want more instruction, more encouragement on this area of dealing with temptation, sin in your life, I'd encourage you back two summers ago, summer 2017, we did a series called License to Kill, Strategies for Killing the Sin Within, and you can go online and, and find those. I encourage you to listen to that series. But as we move forward here, we do see hope in this final petition as we turn things over to God and allow Him to conquer the power of sin, Satan, and his demons, that we might live for his heavenly kingdom. So then the question is, 
can we do this? Can this prayer be fulfilled in the life of New Palestine Bible Church and in our lives individually? Can God's name be made holy here, honored, when we see his kingdom coming, his kingdom purposes, his will being done here, even as heaven in heaven? Can he give us our daily bread and forgive us our debts? And can he protect us and provide us deliverance from temptation and sin so that we as citizens of the king of God's reign, of not Satan and his reign, honor him in our lives? The answer is yes to all of it. Yes, the Lord can do this in our lives. And so, like we've talked about, the heart of this prayer is to recognize we're following Jesus now. Think of those disciples there on the Sermon on the Mount, and they're trying to learn, Jesus, you know, tell us what it's like. What's your kingdom like? What, what is it like to follow you? And he says, this is what it's like. And so the whole thing here is that we would set aside ourselves. We would die to ourself, right, and pick up our cross. We would say, it's no longer about me. It's about you, Lord. It's about your name being honored through my life. It's about your will being done. It's about you providing for me and forgiving me and delivering me. And so we pray. We can get up in the morning and we can pray this prayer. And with this prayer on our lips and on our hearts, we go through our day and we can see opportunities and take them. And God can honor his name through our lives and those choices we make. And then when we face temptation and sin, we can look to God and he can deliver us. And again, he can be honored through that victory. And as we lie our heads down, we can recall how he provided for us everything we needed that day, spiritually and physically. And we can praise his name for how he fulfilled exactly what we had prayed for that morning. And the beautiful thing is, somewhere on the other side of the world, as we're lying our heads to bed, another Christian. The sun's rising and having on their lips and their hearts the Lord's Prayer. And so constantly, over and over and over and over and over again, throughout history until Christ returns, the will of God for his kingdom citizens is being done to the honor and glory of God's great name. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you do that, and we're amazed how you do it. And so, Lord, we spent a lot of time looking over these few words, and I pray that that's been a fruitful exercise in the sense that we've sought to hear the heart of this prayer and bring it out in our lives. So, Lord, we do pray that here at New Palestine Bible Church, in the lives and families represented here, the children in the back as they learn Lord, I pray that your name would be honored. Wherever we go, it would bring honor to your name. Lord, provide for us everything we need, spiritually, physically. We look to you daily for that. Lord, we do look to your kingdom, and wow, we want it now. We want to see your will be done in this earth, Lord, and, and Lord, I pray that we would do as we can to bring honor to you, and, and Lord, that you would have your way in our life. We're so indebted to you, Lord, for our salvation. We need your forgiveness. We rely on it. And so, Lord, please forgive us where we failed. And Lord, we look at the battle going on, and we realize that there is an evil one and he is now our enemy, but we take hope and joy knowing as powerful as it, he is, you are more so. And the one in us is greater than him. And so we walk confidently with peace and joy and say, Lord, you take the victory. You win the battle in our life. Lord, have us not in places of temptation where we're going to fail and, 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 and fail you, Lord, because we want to honor you. So Lord, help us to put ourselves not in any place like that. Continue to transform our hearts to want to be in your presence and rely on you. And Lord, 
You deliver us. We need you. Deliver us that we might honor your name. And may you make your name great throughout this town and this world. And we look forward to someday all worshiping you in glory. Because we're so glad we're part of your family. Adopted sons and daughters. Citizens of you, our great king. Amen.